Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to today's Infopedia web conference. You've joined us for managing a high quality and reliable service delivery. We are broadcasting this web conference by Skype meeting broadcast and the audio can be heard through your PC speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. If you do not consent to being part of a recorded session, we ask that you please disconnect your browser at this time. Attendees may access the web conference recording via a link that will be delivered within 72 hours post-conference. You may ask a question at any time using the Q&A panel located either to the right of your screen or by scrolling down to just below the video pane. Our presenters will be taking your questions throughout the presentation and again at the end of the presentation during a formal Q&A. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's web conference, first try refreshing your web browser by pressing the F5 key. If that doesn't work for you, you'll want to go ahead and click on the support link at the top right corner of your browser. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our session today. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Senior Program Manager Brandon Bernier. Brandon, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Janice. Welcome. Over the next 60 minutes, I will be providing an overview of what it takes to deliver and maintain a healthy Skype for Business online deployment, and covering off which documents are available via SOF to enable you to uh, apply these um, to your deployment. Just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Brandon Bernier. I'm a senior program manager in the customer experience and deployment team. Uh, I've been focused on delivering great UC experiences through improving deployment health, uh, prior to Skype for Business uh, with versions dating back to 2006, capturing feedback and driving features based on customer feedback. Um, I've created the key health indicators for Skype for Business server and contributed to many white papers. As it pertains to SOF, uh, I am the owner of guidance in the operate phase and an active contributor to authoring operate material. Our team is part of the Skype for Business product group and our goal is to enable organizations of any size to get to our Skype for Business online cloud service by providing best-in-class readiness and deployment services. So a little bit about SOF. Um, this session is part of a, a broader Skype uh, operations framework training. We encourage you to review the, the Skype operations framework overview recorded training if you're new to SOF or you would like a refresher. The shift to the cloud changes the way that Skype for Business is delivered, moving from an on-premises uh, model of deployments to online deliveries. Uh, we aim to provide practical guidance to assist with planning, delivering, and operating Skype for Business online. We created this multifaceted approach of the Skype operational framework to essentially provide this practical guidance and associated tools and assets, along with a common language of phases and stages to help drive a common understanding of the Skype for Business online lifecycle. Um, to help folks get on board, we have the Skype Academy to host sessions like this one, and also technical product trainings. And finally, we have um, feedback mechanisms as well to, to get your feedback. Uh, SOF is a living framework. Uh, we are working on updates on a regular basis. So please visit our site uh, to make sure that you get the latest material. Uh, as previously mentioned, the, the Skype operations framework is a living, breathing uh, framework for Skype for Business Online, and we're continually adding new content, uh, updating um, new assets based off of your feedback, based off of things that we're seeing. Um, and we will be uh, updating the training material to cover major updates, but we encourage you to always be working with the latest set of assets, which may have been released since the overview, uh, or excuse me, since this uh, particular session uh, was recorded. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how to manage a quality and reliable service delivery for Skype for Business Online. With the version three of SOF, we focused a lot on making sure that we're giving customers and partners the ability to um, know what guidance is needed, what are the key areas to focus on uh, prior to rolling out Skype for Business. Um, by doing that and um, adopting a lot of this guidance, not only in the planning phase, but making sure that as you move into the operate stage, that a lot of the tasks have owners assigned to them and that these the, the varying tasks that uh, need to be executed on a continual cadence, um, that that work's actually happening. By doing this and accounting for this in the planning phase, it eliminates a lot of that 
that risk of other things coming up in the deployments and you know uh, operations kind of taking a, a back seat to just working on getting it deployed operations is absolutely a key fundamental um, to running a successful deployment so this particular training is it's broken up into two parts there's the first part is focused on what are the core things to do while in the planning phase to enable you to have a healthy and uh, reliable deployment from the get-go the second part of this um, of this training is going to go through and cover off what tools are available to you uh, what processes do we have in the, the, the new things that we've come up with and uh, in delivered on in Skype V3 to make sure uh, to help you um, go through and um, use these things on an ongoing basis? So a little bit more about this activity. Like I said, this is um, we're directly in the, the plan phase. This is intentional. Much of the content for this training is taken directly from the Manage a Quality and Reliable Service Delivery Workshop. Uh, and I'll touch on the additional key areas as well to show um, how SOF can assist you. As previously noted, um, we're in the plan phase. And while there are normally good intentions, and there's usually a, a deployment always starts with a plan to um, execute and implement this operational rigor from the get-go. But normally some things come up in the project, um, more time is needed on some various things, maybe in, in plan and deliver. And the operate piece, you know, it, it's more of a left to sorting it out while, while the deployment is going. Uh, when that happens, you can end up in this reactive mode where you're fixing, you know, problems as they come up. And it's, you're building that operational muscle, but it's creating a lot of churn in the process. And that may lead to spoiling those initial perception with your end users of Skype for Business Online. Um, so the quality requirements that we'll cover, um, these, are, these are absolutely paramount to deliver and maintain consistent quality for, for end users. Um, the categories that these cover uh, it runs the gamut from audio to reliability, devices, clients to even end user sentiment. These are all super critical things uh, when it comes to assessing uh, and managing the health of a Skype for Business Online deployment. Um, by proactively designing for quality prior to deployment, it, it's giving you this opportunity to make sure that you've got the right foundation in place so that you're not ending up uh, in these reactive types of situations. Uh, an analogy that I like to use to, to think about this is it's much easier to build the airplane while it's on the ground versus trying to build it while it's in flight. The prerequisites um, for this activity, they're, they're, there's not a lot. This is, this is meant to happen very early on in the deployment. Uh, a couple of the things that would, would be useful prior to running this activity is ensuring that the discovery questionnaire and the envisioning workshop are completed. That way, you have an idea as to the scope of the deployment and know what are some of the key to help get, you, um, get, get started on what are the areas to focus on operationalizing. By the end of this training, you will be familiar with understanding the key concepts of the end user experience, understanding the quality requirements of the deployment and why they are so important, knowing what tools and processes are available to you um, and what assets to help um, assist uh, should there be areas, should you need to go through and troubleshoot any specific areas. And lastly, uh, give you a sense of some of the service management activities that are also needed to maintain a, a healthy deployment. As we go through the slides in this presentation, you'll notice that in the upper right-hand corner, there is a little banner. Uh, in the banner, it's got to manage for uh, quality and reliability deployment deck. What that's indicating is the deck of where the slide came from. So if you want to go through and uh, dig into this um, after this particular session, this is just giving you the reference back to where this material came from. All right, so let's start off with talking a little bit about the user experience.
At a high level, the user experience breaks, <clears throat> breaks down into a couple categories. A few of these are subjective, um, a few of them are, are objective. The things that we want to fo focus on are the things that we know are definitely leading indicators towards something potentially negative going on in the environment. So we heavily focus on the objective measures and additionally for um, the areas where they're subjective, um, essentially from this slide, Reliability and call quality, those are things that we consider objective. Um, things that are subjective would be um, user satisfaction, things such as uh, rate my call, uh, looking for um, any type of feedback that comes from an out-of-band survey, right? A perception of an expectation setting of what a user expects and what the experience is to them. Um, people may have varying standards on that definition, which goes through and makes it subjective. but the key things to really think about of the user experience are reliability um, would probably be at the, the forefront of this all up. To me, this is the absolute most important category. You can go through and look at quality, call quality, and you can say, well, you know, this, these users had a negative experience. We need to go through and come up with a plan to um, essentially remediate that and improve that experience. And that's something that has to be done regardless. But when you look at the, rely, the, the, the category of reliability, that's specifically talking about, I couldn't set up a call or I was in a call and it dropped at some point later on. Um, just due to the severity, um, the critical severity of that particular bucket, um, it's imperative to make sure that there's a way to measure and um, hone in on specific areas where that's happening so that you can come up with a remediation plan to go through and um, improve the experience for, um, for your users. The good thing though is when it comes to go through and, and rolling out your deployment, a lot of the re reliability specifically with call setup failures, that's normally a, a setting uh, and a, it's or a mis or a, uh, due to incomplete firewall rules for the most part. That seems to be the, the top contributor to that. So maybe when the deployment is, is brand new, um, maybe there was a firewall rule or two that was missed, but once you've gone through, remediated that, that bucket should go through and uh, vastly drop off. But it's important to operationalize looking at these specific categories and making sure that um, there's not any areas where those call setup failures or mid-calls are, are increasing. The second bit here around call quality is really thinking about what have I done from a deployment perspective to ensure that I'm delivering call quality in all scenarios. There's, and it's, there, there's a lot of things to consider for that scenario um, all up. There's the areas in which you manage, so that would be your wired network, your, your wireless network, um, essentially anything inside of the corporate environment. You have great influence and control over that. And if there's something that, if there is a negative experience going on from that perspective, it is within your realm to go through and get that resolved. Um, when it comes to things such as, what can I do to best arm users that are in a remote location, uh, they might be at home, they might be at a coffee shop or you know an airport, hotel. Um, those things are just notorious for providing inconsistent um, internet. So if you have a uh, you know a critical meeting, what should a user do in those uh, specific cases? There's some guidance that you can do, uh, making sure that they're um, following that the they're using certified headsets to kind of take out the noise canceling from the if they're in a really noisy area. Uh, potentially, if they're on a really bad internet connection they might want to dial in um, but those are the types of things too so from essentially looking at the call quality bucket where we spend the lion's share of our time is really around what are the things that you can fix so you'll notice that there's um, a lot more guidance in the managed network and a lot of advising in the unmanaged space So visualizing um, this particular slide, it, it's, there's a, a good relationship between this slide and the previous slide with the concepts are the same, but it's just showing you all of the different touch points that is going to take to deliver a, uh, a quality service. This is a real-time solution. 
Everything has to work just flawlessly. It's only as good as the weakest link. It's not like another you know, infrastructure component such as Exchange, where if email is delayed by a minute or two, that's generally acceptable and it, that would go unnoticed. Whereas in a real-time solution, um, that experience would not be acceptable. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of operational rigor to ensure that all of the touch points have processes in place to ensure that they're configured appropriately and running adequately. On the left-hand side, you'll see that um, this is the, the Microsoft side of the house where we handle the network, uh, the servers that are providing the service. And on the right-hand side, this is the, the corporate network, which consists of a lot of areas. As I previously noted, there's the, wi the, the wired network, the Wi-Fi network, there's, there's firewalls, there's usually packet shapers, um, you know, the circuits to actually get to the service, making sure that there's enough bandwidth to reach the service. Um, and additionally, there's, there's endpoints as well um, that, go, that ranges from a, a lot of different things, such as ensuring that you know, you're running a relatively new version of Skype for Business using a certified headset, that the machines themselves, that they actually have the capacity of running Skype for Business. Um, and I'll go into uh, those focus areas in greater detail uh, in some of the additional slides. But this is where we use um, CQD which I'll be talking about later on, to really assess, identify, and help call out any of the problems that exist on either the corporate network or these other networks so that you can see where, if any, uh, there's areas that need remediation and where you should focus your time. Um, the area that, need, that is of um, limited control is other networks. It's could be anything, hotels, coffee shops. Um, this could be, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? open op uh, other types of open loud areas um, that are, are, are not well connected. And as is mentioned earlier, that is uh, more of an area where we advise, but we will focus on the pieces that are managed. When we look at the key components of how do we operationalize um, Skype for Business Online, where do we, where should a customer or partner really focus their, their time? It essentially breaks into three different categories. There's the category of, of networks, which talks about the things that we just previously discussed, all the networking gear, all of the, the, the bandwidth things, and um, endpoints, which cover off obviously headsets, phones, um, could be Wi-Fi drivers, uh, those types of devices. And then there's this other category of service management. It's intentionally broken up into um, two different categories of service management. There's the piece that Microsoft runs, um, Microsoft's responsibility of the servers, the network, just making sure that um, any customer connecting to Skype for Business Online, that that service is as rock solid as it can be and, and ready to, to service users. But there's also some management that's needed um, in various areas to make sure that um, from a customer partner perspective that the, the road to the service um, is paved as, as best that it can be. Uh, for example, with QoS is, is certainly uh, a, a big one, making sure that as new IP addresses and new servers are added into the service, that there is an operational process to take those things and make sure that there's no disruption in service because there's a firewall that um, just can't communicate to those new devices. As we're in the plan piece of this deployment, think through the following. Is the network really configured and ready to deliver real-time solutions? Um, this means implementing QAS on all areas of the managed network. This is super critical. Um, ensuring that there's enough bandwidth to reach the Skype for Business um, online service. Um, not routing over VPN. Uh, there's been a lot of cases where when you're routing over the VPN, uh, what that tends to do is it introduces this uh, this double encryption. Uh, VPN devices themselves, you know, it, it goes back to the question of what was my VPN designed to handle? Was it designed to accommodate real-time solutions? More often than not, it's usually not 
um, designed to, to, to take on that type of workload. Um, so what's suggested in that space is to route around the VPN. Uh, the common industry ways to do that really pivot around uh, enabling this feature called split tunnel. VPNs work in one of two ways typically, which is a, a forced tunnel, which means everything goes through the VPN tunnel. Or there's a split tunnel, which means only things destined towards the internal network are going to go there. But it's not just about um, making sure that there's enough bandwidth um, and routing over VPN and having quas in place. Uh, it's about Wi-Fi too, um, more, more so I'd say than, than on the wired network. It's, it's not uncommon uh, to miss Wi-Fi planning. Uh, it, it, it's a very similar conversation as to what we have with VPN. When the Wi-Fi solution was introduced for an organization, was it planned to accommodate real-time workloads? And then understanding, well, if, if no, then some of the things that you can run, run into is something similar that you'll see on the wired networks, which is um, the, the um, implementing um, quas or the, um, the WMM settings to make sure that it's, it's getting that prioritization. But there's other things too that, that fall into line, such as um, the band that's in use. Um, for specifically the differences between the 2.4 gigahertz range and the five. The big difference between those is a lot of companies um, have older Wi-Fi equipment that usually um, steers people towards the 2.4 range. And that, that can be okay, uh, depending on the floor placement of a lot of these, these APs. They have a lot of range, but they're also susceptible to a lot of consumer devices too, because there's a lot of things that run in that particular range. So by mo going through and looking at a Wi-Fi design and seeing uh, if it's relatively new, that's focusing on getting to the five gigahertz range. That's really where you wanna be. It's a very dense range. It doesn't have as much um, coverage, but for the areas where it does have coverage, it's extremely dense um, and is more aligned to delivering real-time workloads. So understanding if the network configuration, if it's under heavy load, um, it, it comes back to understanding what's in place to monitor the network. Um, I've seen some examples where a deployment, um, the, the deployment team, they'll consult with their networking team on the bandwidth requirements and say, yeah, it looks great. Uh, for this particular link in this building, only 70% is used. Uh, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, this seems to align. But if you kind of peel back the layers as to what makes up that 70% number, um, it goes into, you'll find out that that 70% number isn't quite 70%. It's actually, it, it turned out to be, in, in the particular case that I'm citing, is it turned out to include weekends, uh, evenings. So what that was doing was, it was averaging out any of the hotspot or busy hours that were occurring throughout the day. So it was actually masking that there was a problem. So when you're doing that type of planning, it's, it's really important to, to look at that all up, uh, not only looking at what's the, what's the average, that's a, a, a nice measurement to know, but making a decision based off of that alone, that can get you in some hot water. So just be careful when looking at averages. Uh, and then making a direct connection to Skype for Business Online. That means where possible, not going um, through proxies. It is um, in terms of how we establish media calls, uh, it's the lowest of a failback ordering to establish a call. It's, it's there so that in the worst case scenario, the call can be established, but it's not preferred. It runs into a lot of similar things that we would see um, kind of with the, the, the VPN planning. Was the proxy designed to handle this? Um, does the proxy support UDP? Um, and then there's, there's other benefits that proxies provide that can also introduce problems. Uh, and those features specifically are usually doing any type of packet inspection or some sort of packet shaper that's going in and trying to modify um, uh, the payload. Those that can typically result in a dropped call and, and or a, a negative experience to the end user. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it. So why introduce this additional piece of complexity to the media path when you can just avoid it and, and route around it? Um, and in terms of network reliability and configuration, as you're starting off your deployments and you're in the planning phase, 
Go through and do um, a, a network assessment. These are really critical to do and make sure that you do it for both wired and wireless for, for all of the buildings where you're rolling out Skype for Business. This really makes sure that um, gives you that leading indicator before you've done your deployment that from my planning exercise, here's the numbers that we've produced. Um, uh, essentially, it's giving you that, that gut check of knowing that what I've put on paper how it's going to go through and actually uh, work when it comes into to practice. It gives you some assertion by um, um, going through and actually testing that on those particular network segments where Skype for Business Online will be deployed. So strongly recommend doing a network assessment to uh, sanity check all of the, the numbers and planning that goes on in the early stage. So for endpoints, um, there's, there's a lot of things here, such as are the PCs in my organization, are, are they capable of running Skype for Business? Um, I, I've seen it on, on numerous occasions where just running bare minimum uh, requirements. And in, in some cases, that's okay because it is meeting the, the, the criteria to, to, to run Skype for Business. But where it gets interesting is if you start looking at, you know, and this varies by um, corporation to corporation, but if you start looking at all of the other stuff that's running in the background, all the other tasks, all the IDS systems, all the, the antivirus, all these things that are running on the machine, what's that doing to, to the, the base performance of that machine? And just understanding that as you roll this out, um, when, it, when an end user gets on a, a call, is that going to go through and essentially make the PC uh, hit the tipping point? And if by some chance um, it does, granted um, you'll have gone through and have planned for this prior, but it, should you hit the operation stage with PCs in this type of configuration um, inside of CQD, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, there are some things that can help you, such as um, understanding that when a call is bad, um, it'll go through and tell you there's a, a dimension to go through and look at, which will indicate whether there was a client-side activity of the CPU being essentially uh, running at capacity, which could have been uh, influencing a negative experience on that particular PC. Uh, <clears throat> then understanding what is the update strategy to ensure that users running um, Skype for Business, that they're getting newer versions consistently. Uh, we are going, as a product group, we are going through and continually refining and optimizing Skype for Business. And we want to make sure that all of those fixes and all of those improvements um, that your end users are bene benefiting from the work that we've done. It also helps from the perspective of if you don't manage the number of um, versions of Skype for Business inside of the inside of um, your organization, what can happen is you'll get this version bloat. What that means is you'll go from saying I, I want to plan to run no more than five or six versions of Skype for Business, Skype for Business at any time. That gives you that consistent experience. If someone calls in and says, "Hey, I'm having you know problem X," it's fair to say that well because my organization is on these couple versions, you can make an assessment and go through and look at through data and see, you know, it's on the, it's a problem with this particular version. I can go look at this data. X number of people are impacted. I need to go through and get to a newer version. If you have this, you know, um, problem of having, you know, 20, 30, 40 versions of Skype for Business, it's really hard to provide that consistent experience. Um, so we heavily advise running newer versions of Skype for Business. One thing that uh, we've run into um, recently is the impact of client-side firewalls. Uh, we talk very much about what needs to happen on the network side and what ports need to be opened. Uh, but typically, there's some sort of um, antivirus firewall software that can uh, get in the way. Uh, I've seen it go through and delay calls. I've seen it um, actually get to the point where it actually calls couldn't be established. So making sure that you account in your planning for if you have client-side firewalls to make sure that the appropriate ports and exclusions are created for, um, for Skype for Business, uh, your end users will appreciate it and that'll be something that you won't run into.
Um, for a strategy for updating Wi-Fi drivers, it, it's really a Wi-Fi specific thing. Uh, it's not so much, I, I can't really say that I've seen a lot of um, examples where there has been a need to upgrade wired drivers. Um, and I think that just primarily may be that the feature set around what's delivered over you know, a, a wired network, it's been fundamentally the same for quite a long time. With Wi-Fi, that's changing consistently. There's different bands, different frequencies, different radios, you name it. And then in, on top of how the OS handles it and the relationship to Wi-Fi drivers, some of the things that we can see is um, while we want to steer people towards that five gigahertz band is sometimes depending on the the version of the driver it'll always make people stick on the 2.4 uh, version or the the aggressiveness of roaming between ap's uh, isn't quite um, up to speed so that's not something we see um, a lot of but it is something to um, bring up with your client team uh, to go through and essentially look at these things on a regular basis. When you look at poor calls, understanding if there's any type of trend that seems to relate it back to Wi-Fi drivers. And if so, then it's usually working with that manufacturer of that driver and just seeing if there's a newer version, testing it in a lab, and then um, uh, rolling that out to your, to your environment. For devices, this really comes down to um, making sure that people are using um, certified devices. Um, using anything that's um, made for Skype for Business, that is going to go such a long way for, uh, a, in, for a positive impact to the user experience. Um, it's very frequent where we see that people are using their built-in um, speaker and microphone, and to them, they sound fine. They, it's no problem, no problem to them. They can hear things just fine. But a lot of those drivers and, and just that scenario of just built-in laptop stuff isn't quite optimized to do noise cancellation, any type of uh, other you know ambient noise that, that's coming around you. It just comes across as just, it's very loud and it's disruptive to the other people that are uh, in the meeting and can lead to degrading their experience. So for that reason, um, going through and driving the use of certified headsets, that'll just go a huge way with your end users. All right, so we've talked a lot about this across the, the various slides, but it's so important that if there's one thing that you take away from this training, it's that these are the things that you need to do to make sure that you're delivering a high quality deployment from the get-go and that there's processes in place to maintain all of these things on an ongoing basis. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about Quas. Some of the questions that I get on that specifically are, why do I need to do this? My network is fine. I, I, don't, I don't need Quas. My, my network guy says that there's, there's ample bandwidth. But the thing is, it's, Quas isn't doing anything when you're just running normally. It's there is more of an insurance policy for if you're approaching saturation levels on a, on a specific link that you don't have internet, regular, you know, internet traffic competing with voice traffic. And that voice traffic is going through and getting that higher priority. So it's insure, important to make sure that on all aspects of the managed network that, um, that QoS is, is properly in place. Yeah, we've already we've talked about uh, bypassing the proxy for Office 365 traffic. The traditional way to do this, and it it varies from vendor to vendor, but the, the the common theme that we see is it usually comes down to this pack file um, that's used to essentially say what goes to the proxy and what doesn't, uh, making sure that that contains all of the ranges for Office 365, so that there's a direct path to get there without having to go through the proxy. Um, split tunnel. We've we've already we've already touched off on that. Uh, VPN is is, is bad. Uh, don't do it. Strongly recommend routing around it. Uh, for number four, ensuring that the right ports and protocols are open. Most deployments get most of these right from the get go. Um, the thing that we frequently see is that TCP will be opened. 
um, and the call's up, and there, there may or may not be a problem. But what we really want, and what we really put a lot of emphasis on, is making sure that specifically for audio, that it's using UDP wherever possible. This usually comes back to there being incomplete firewall rules. Making sure that this is in place will make sure that we use the, the right transport. Um, and the reason that that's important, um, it just goes back to the fundamental differences between UDP and TCP. TCP is stateful, UDP is not. If you're on a network that is not the best or running into um, various um, you know congestion types of, of problems, you now have, active voice packets that need to be processed competing with previous voice packets that are getting retransmitted to the user. So once you get into that state with TCP, um, it's just going to compound any poor audio problems that you have and make the audio healer that we have in Skype for Business work a lot harder than it has to. So make sure that um, UDP ports are opened. Opening the high port range, that's a must for quality. And it also gives you the ability of making sure that, um, making sure it's giving you another perfectly good media path that by not having those ports opened, um, you wouldn't get. So it's just giving another avenue to connect in the event that the more preferred methods of connecting weren't connecting. So you still get that good degree of fallback using the high port range and getting the quality pieces of that. Um, using phones op and devices optimized for Skype for Business, again, ties back into uh, using the latest client versions. Uh, that's super critical, as well as making sure that um, you, you take the time to do a network readiness assessment and make sure that the the, inter the, the planning of internet egress points for the circuits uh, from buildings getting to, to the service, that they're right-sized and that's... Um, that there's uh, any Wi-Fi optimizations that are needed um, are in place. One last thing on Wi-Fi. Um, we've seen it where some folks have um, said, all right, our end users are not going to per, um, connect on Wi-Fi. We've given them wired connections. They're going to use that. Um, they shouldn't be running on Wi-Fi. Then they'll come back and they'll say, hey, well, our, our users are still running into the poor experiences, but what's going on? And then what it turns out to be is that there's, um, in Windows, there's a, a binding order for the interfaces. And what's happening is, even though you're wired, um, it's still connected to Wi-Fi, and it's getting that preference and going through and routing it over Wi-Fi. So there's a little bit of planning to make sure that um, when you're, even when you're wired, to make sure that you're not inadvertently um, routing that call over Wi-Fi, unless you really intended to do that. So for service management, I'll just touch on a couple things here. This is a, a really broad area. Um, it covers things from user management to capacity management to service planning, uh, i.e. making sure that the firewalls have the latest IPs uh, to connect to Office 365, making sure that the help desk has what they need. Do they have the right KB articles, the right run books in order to go through and, and adequately um, help um, your end users should they have problems with Skype for Business. So there's a lot of areas here. Um, there's actually a dedicated session um, on service management tomorrow. And what that's really going to cover is um, the operational role mapping. And what that comes down to is, as part of service management and the other quality requirements that we've talked about to this point, is there's a list of tasks that have to be done. But we need to go through and make sure that there's an owner assigned to all of these things. This is one of the things that is consistently missed, or it's a, more of a something that comes up in a meeting, it's verbal, doesn't formally get documented, and then when you actually need to um, ask someone for this, they may not be prepared to go through and help in this space. This is something that you do in the planning phase where we've got all of the, what the activities are, what's the responsibility, what it encompasses, how frequently do you need to do this, who should be doing it, and then really assigning that group or, um, or person to that, just to make sure that these tasks are going to be um, actioned on a regular cadence to help um, maintain that quality user experience. All right, so everything that we've talked about so far, uh, we'll switch gears. We've been talking about everything that's needed in the plan phase. This is about 
how do I manage the experience? This is more of um, what assets have we provided inside of Soft V3 and how do they help you um, go through and identify, assert, maintain, dig into specific problem areas as they come up uh, in your deployment. The primary tool that we use for this, this is the, the, the call quality dashboard. The call quality dashboard is a absolutely fantastic tool. It is very powerful. At the end of every session, a report is sent up to the service uh, from the user's client that essentially has a lot of telemetry based on that experience. Um, CQD then uses um, aggregate information. There's no, there's no user specific things in here. There's, you can't see if Bob called Alice and what the experience was. It's more of a problem management tool to understand how is a building performing? How is a network performing? Um, to answer those types of questions. So CQD itself, while it's the, the top tool uh, that we use to essentially that we've built this foundation of um, uh, tooling and operational material around, it provides a lot of different things. Um, it's not just call quality. We can extract information about um, the client versions that are in use, the devices that are in use, if there's problems with devices, whether it be um, endpoints or excuse me, um, like actual headsets or the PC itself, we can get that level of detail. Uh, one thing that I would say about CQD is that while it does capture the majority of voice traffic, there are some scenarios at present that it just it does not include. Um, those two are um, cloud-provided conferencing dialing sessions. That leg is not in CQD. And also the CCE, um, should you have the Cloud Connector Edition deployed, to um, the to your gateway leg of the call. Those those things aren't there. But everything else that originates from a Skype for Business client or is involving a Skype for Business client, those types of such sessions are there. Well, when it comes to best practices, um, it's really all about conferencing. Start there. Get conferencing really great. If you miss a couple of firewall rules and peer-to-peer -peer calls aren't going from you know. Um, they're not staying on your managed network and they're relaying off of um, the service. What you can do is by saying, if I fix everything and spend a lot of my time on conferencing, you will naturally improve that scenario. And then you get the opportunity to come back after you've resolved anything that may um, need remediation in the conferencing piece to then look at the peer-to-peer -peer section as more of a, a traffic optimization. All right. So in terms of the soft provided resources, um, the very first thing to do is to leverage the configuring CQD guide. This goes into detail about mapping networks to buildings. It may sound like a minor activity, but it's absolutely critical. So let's say that the, the data hasn't been uploaded for CQD in terms of the um, network to the building relationship. So with that, you don't know where a subnet is without looking up uh, that independently. But more so, you have no point of reference. So if I see there's a problem on a subnet in a building, what do I compare it to? Ideally, when you have the buildings uploaded, you compare that experience to other subnets in that building. By virtue of doing that, you can see, is it isolated to this particular subnet? If not, if it's coming from the entire building, odds are, it probably has a common egress point or circuit to actually reach the service. That should probably be where I start my investigation. If you see that as something on that one subnet, then it's probably something localized to that. But just looking at the subnets one by one, um, it's not as effective as looking at uh, buildings holistically. If you're somewhat new to CQD, we have a lot of start getting started materials there. There's a, a six, um, video series. They're all about 15 to 30 minutes in length each. That kind of give you this um, snackable bit into each of the fundamental pieces of, um, get, of, of CQD. So if you're brand new to CQD or just kind of want a refresher in some of the, the tools and tips as to how we conduct investigations or what some of the core foundations of CQD are, please check out these videos. We also have a guide um, inside of um, soft called Getting Started with CQD that can help you in these areas too. 
So the other two things in this area where we've spent a ton of time in the last couple months um, that we're just delivering now is the sample CQD templates. These are a curated set of reports that we've used with customers over the last three to four months to essentially figure out what are the right reports that work for us and what are the right focus areas and then building sub reports below them to essentially get from there's something I want to understand what's going on at an organizational level. I then want to get to the point of uh, what's going on with the building to then what do I go look at with the building? Who do I need to talk to? What's the right question that I need to ask of my networking team to help get these things resolved. So you'll notice that there's a set of sample of uh, templates that are there to help you. There's two of them. One of them focuses on um, you, you uploading the building data. That's the majority of our guidance is strongly focused on um, that particular scenario. Then there's another uh, template as well, and that's just called a, a no building information template. There's still some insights about the organization and subnets that you can get without getting to the building level. Uh, not preferred, but given that the timing varies to complete this from customer to customer, we wanted to give you a temporary template to use while you're working on getting that building information uploaded. Uh, and then we have the monitoring playbook. This goes hand in hand with the, the templates. The playbook helps you identify what, what the key metrics are, um, starting the conversation as to what those thresholds should be for your organization, then measuring it for your organization. Um, it is very similar to what we were doing with the CQD templates, getting to that next level of detail with, um, if I want to look at, um, you know, at a build, at a, building by building uh, perspective, if I want to look at it by region, if I want to look at it by conferencing, all of those things are there. And there's a process to help guide you um, to quickly operationalize um, these things into your deployment so that, um, so that you can quickly get started um, assessing the environment and remediating anything as you see it, should there be anything that needs to be remediated. Real quick on the playbook and template itself. Uh, these, the templates in the playbook are broken into these areas, audio, reliability, user survey, devices, and clients. So for audio, again, it's, it's the whole, what does my organization look like between good and poor calls, getting down to that um, particular building metric, um, looking at VPN specifically and seeing what the experience is on that if you haven't routed around it already. Same thing goes for proxies. If you wanna see what the TCP usage is in the environment, you can go through and you can get those things uh, as well. For reliability, there is strong focus on showing you uh, where call setup failures are happening and what the reason code is behind that. Uh, usually those reason codes are things like uh, relay not reachable, um, uh, user candidate check failed, which are all things that are indicative of incomplete firewall rules. And with that, you can pivot it off of buildings to see, hey, uh, building A is going to, has this device in front of it to get to the service. I should probably go look at this device. So that's probably where the firewall rule is. Um, for, for rate my call, the extent of what we have in there right now is specifically giving you a breakdown as to um, what the user sentiment is. It doesn't give you the verbatims as to what the users said, but it goes through and it tells you from an organizational perspective, how are users rating their overall experience? And then you can break that down by building as well. If you see there's a trend with a building, that's an indicator to go through and look at the audio reliability experience for that building, see if there's something going on there. Uh, but additionally, it goes into devices and clients as well with making sure that uh, you're on a version that's newer and that will call out what devices are prevalent inside your organization, making sure that you're going towards the use of certified headsets. The operational lifestyle or life cycle for this is by using the playbook, you get to assert by looking at organizational data, finding areas of interest. Uh, you then conduct an investigation uh, to see what's wrong with that, remediate it. That feeds into the achieve piece of this and then leading into maintain. So once you've gone through and done this, this bit to achieve, monitoring those particular pieces on an ongoing basis to make sure that whatever problems were fixed prior, that those are remediated and that there's not anything new that occurs. So um, just to recap what we've covered today, 
Um, the quality requirements are paramount to deliver and maintain consistent quality experiences. Uh, planning for these areas and tasks, it greatly reduces the surface area for negative um, user experiences. I cannot put enough emphasis on that. Um, designing for operations and quality prior to the deployment, again, it stops you from getting into that reactive phase in your, in your deployment. It helps you, it turns the runbook into being something that you would just completely rely on and that's something you're living in and out of on a day-to-day -day basis to something that you're doing, but you're not having to spend as much time in it because you've already spent all of, you know, you've put in the time and effort to make sure that the right things are already in place. So there should be less things that need remediation. First, if you don't do them and do the inverse and troubleshoot it um, when there's more problems. And then lastly, a lot of the things, actually most of the new things that we have inside of Scott, um, Soft V3, these are specifically here to help you with these areas, helping telling you what the key things are, helping you narrow down the areas of investigation um, for anything that impacts audio, um, uh, quality and reliability. So as we said earlier, um, this is a community. This isn't. There's an ongoing effort to go through and essentially um, update these things on a regular cadence. If you have feedback, we really want to hear it. We read every single piece of it, and that goes into our planning exercises to make sure that the things that that are coming up and trending within the community that those are top of mind for us and things that we should go through and take on in in relatively short order. If you have any questions, please go through and feel free to ask us uh, via the the link provided in the center. And kindly uh, stay up to date with um, our announcements and all of our releases by visiting the, the blog listed in the link. With that, uh, before we go to Q&A, Janice, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Brandon. All right, audience, as Brandon mentioned, we're going to be uh, starting our Q&A in just a moment. Just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by typing the question into the white text box located either on the right-hand side of your screen or by scrolling down to just below the video pane. Before we get started with that, however, I'd like to bring your attention to a link on the upper right-hand side of the viewing window that says, please take a short survey. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference, and we ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from 1 to 5, with 5 being the highest score possible. And I see that we do have a couple questions in the queue here, so Brandon, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thanks to the folks who have submitted some questions. Uh, there's a few here that I'll go through. Um, so this says, I'm in the pilot phase of my deployment and I haven't followed most of these requirements. No one is complaining. Why do I need to follow these? So if you're in the pilot phase of your deployment and uh, it, it's, it's encouraging that the users so far have not complained, but what indicators are, have been put in place to make sure that as you grow it from that pilot to that larger scale, um, you know, uh, service that's encomp encompassing uh, or everyone in the organization using it. For those reasons, implement the, um, the the quality requirements. While things are good now, I would not take that as an indicator of success tomorrow. Um, does the playbook cover rate my call? Uh, it covers portions of rate my call. Uh, it specifically focuses on uh, just providing the um, the scoring or showing you what the percentage of good to poor is and the essentially the count of surveys that were submitted so that you can get a feel for of the rate my call submissions that were submitted, what is the overall satisfaction of those? And then you can break it down by building to see if there's some sort of trend, should there be something negative um, that you see from looking at that data. There's another question here. Uh, we started to use CQM about a year and a half ago to manage quality in our on-prem deployment. How does the introduction of this playbook affect CQM? Uh, it doesn't. So a lot of the concepts in this playbook, uh, we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel with that. CQM is, uh, is, is pretty rock solid. Uh, we've taken the fundamentals of that and expanded upon them. Um, but instead of pivoting off of the tools that CQM leverages, we pivot them off of CQD. So thanks uh, again, everybody, for the questions. 
Um, if there's um, there's some additional resources all about SOF where you can see these these trainings, uh, please visit the links below. But uh, thank you for your time, and Janice, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you, Brandon. All right, attendees may access the web conference recording via a link that will be delivered within 72 hours post-conference. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Brandon, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for logging in and joining us today. This does conclude today's web conference, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>